Hello everybody, welcome to White Oak Estate and Gardens here in Baton Rouge. It's so nice to have you visiting with us. We're out on our patio with all this beautiful foliage behind us. It's just a gorgeous morning out here and I love cooking outside uh, here at White Oak. Uh, I do a lot of cooking demos out here, but today I'm really honored to have a close, close friend of mine who, who we've known forever, uh, David Hubble, who lives in Mobile, Alabama, and who drove into Baton Rouge this morning to share with you one of our great passions, and that is the history of the Mellon. Now, welcome to White Oak. Thank you, Chef. Happy to be here. Good, good. Now, now, everybody, I think, in the South, is probably familiar with the chayote, or the melaton as we call it, mm -hmm. the chayote squash. And there's so many debates in history. You and I were just uh, talking earlier. Right. You were saying that you thought it came from Haiti. Or? Haiti or Canary Islands, but Mesoamerica, as you right. believe, and it came up probably the late 1700s, 18, early 1800s, came into New Orleans. Right. And that's how it kind of got in this area. Right, and I, and I think that's, that's what I hear too. I know that, I know that when the uh, uh, early explorers went to, uh, and met up with the Incas and the Aztecs, this, they saw this vegetable mm -hmm. for the first time. Uh, we also know that, that you mentioned the Canary Island, the Los Islanos, as they mm -hmm. call them, that came to Louisiana in 1765 when Spain took over New Orleans from France. The Los Islanos came and settled that area, and of course they brought with them, we think, uh, possibly the green or the more important white. And you have that one right there. Tell us a little bit about the white melaton. And look at the difference in them. Put those two together yeah. right there. See that? There's all kind of varieties. And as you talk about coming from Mesoamerica, because melaton are found throughout the whole world. I mean, the one of your shows you talk about China. There's also right. uh, Germany. Some of these grown in Germany. Right. But this one in particular believes that the white ones came from a variety of white out of Puerto Rico. And Sometime around the maybe 800th century, 1900, uh, they believed to have arrived in Louisiana. Right. And this one in particular is special because it's grown by a man out of Opelousas, Louisiana, Israel Thibodeau. And his brother, from what we understand, about 1970, gave him, I don't know how many, but he gave him at least one. And so <laughs> he got the one, and for about 40 years, he grew them. Uh, that was his hobby, his passion. Right. And he, as far as we know, He's the only one that has got this one. You can see it's got the deep grooves in it. Uh, very similar in, in a pear shape, but it's yeah. it's just it's a, an ivory white. And this one is smooth, and this one has the ridges, as right. you mentioned. And on the bottom right here, why don't you talk about how the vine actually, because this is a vine plant it's for, in the cucumber, the melon family, and uh, and this is where the vine uh, will uh, uh, eventually right. uh, come out once it's planted. So the vines have both male and female flowers on it. And so what will happen is that you'll see is the female flower will look like a tiny melancholy. And what will happen is it gets pollinated. Uh, inside of here is a single seed. And that seed is basically an embryo, I think is how it's right, described. Right, right. And it'll, it'll grow. They'll hang on the vine. And then eventually when they're ready to pick, you pick them. If you let them wait a little longer, what will happen is down at the bottom, that little embryo will drop out and you'll start to see a sprout coming out. And then roots in the sprout, and, uh, and then you're ready to plant. Right, no, exactly. And the fact is, just to show you this, I actually cut one of the melaton because normally you have to poach them in a light, lightly salted water to get them tender because they're very hard. But right here, if you can see this, mm -hmm. here's that embryo. Everything needed to germinate this plant and to keep this plant alive, to keep the uh, to get the vine and the roots out. Uh, here's the seed right here. I can pull it out just like that. That's the embryo. And we always take this out when we do cook them uh, from scratch. When we cut them open, we'll pull the seed out. And uh, you can plant this as well. So I've gone ahead. You can take that one right there. I've gone ahead and. Uh, Here's the other half of it, and that's the seed right there. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to turn the heat on here. And what I want you to do, uh, once these are nice and tender, you can see it, you have a little spoon over there. Let me have one as well. Uh, and what I like to do is just to, once they're tender, just go in and scoop that meat out like this. You know, just kind of get that meat out. I'm going to throw it in your pan. Sure. And I just scrape it until I, because what I'm trying to do is create a receptacle to put all of the stuffing that I'm going to make right now. So you go ahead. You, you've done this enough. Oh, yeah, yeah. You don't need my help. Right? <laughs> well, okay, let, let, let me tell you how I make my stuffing. And every family up and down the coast 
have their own recipe for stuffed melly chunk. And I'm going to begin, I have a little bit of butter in here, but I have onions, I have celery, I have three colored bell peppers, I have garlic. Do mm -hmm. you put all oh, of that in Oh, yeah. Look at that. Oh, my God. Look how beautiful that is. Garlic is a secret ingredient. The garlic is. Mm -hmm. I want to put a fair amount of garlic in. Now, the melly chunk is, I mean, a very subtle flavor, so you certainly want to... Uh, add additional flavors too, so you have, and color, because you see the white melaton is just a really uh, snow white, so you want to add some beautiful color just for high appeal on the table. So once this is sauteed nicely like this, now you can put ground meat in here at right, this point, right? right? What's right. your favorite uh, uh, side uh, uh, filling to go in here? Usually I just use shrimp. Well, but yeah. I've done shrimp and uh, I've done brown pork. I've done new dad before too. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. You say a shrimp, look at here. Oh yeah. Uh, look at those. Oh, <laughs> I'm jumping out. Oh yeah, but I'm gonna put those two back in. And uh, just so the other uh, family of seafood in the uh -huh. Gulf of Mexico, I'm gonna put some crab jumbo meat. lump crab meat. Take a look at this. Pearls of the swamp lands, they call this. And I'm gonna put them uh, in and kind of stir that around a little bit. So you can see what I'm doing. I'm doing the base of the stuffing that's going to go into. Now you have it all uh, Now give them a, a good show of what that okay. looks like now. So what you want to do too is you got to be careful because if you scrape too hard, you're gonna, the shell can be delicate after it's been boiled. So you want, like Chef said, you want to keep it as a receptacle. So you want a little, maybe, I don't know, a quarter inch maybe left of the flesh in there so that you can stuff it and it has some support. That's right. Now, I'm gonna, now I'm making the stuffing right here and I'm going to give you a good shot. I'm going to tilt this skillet up to you. Take a look at this. Beautiful, y'all. Reminds me of my baby picture. Take a look at that right now. The crab meat, the shrimp, all of that beautiful butter, the onion, celery, bell pepper, garlic. My God, we piling on here, y'all. Back onto the fire. And then I'm going to add the melaton into it right here. Uh, I'm going to get this melaton has already been pulled out, mm -hmm. and I'm going to add that one in as well, and I'm going to just stir that around. Now remember, the melaton is already poached, right? So it's going to be in a good shape there. I'm going to continue to cook this, and then as it starts to cook down in the juices of the crab and all of that starts to flavor, I'll come in with a little bit, why don't you put a little pepper and garlic in there, a little... Uh, pepper, a uh, little uh, granulated garlic. Or, uh, now remember, I have fresh garlic already. Now, oh, now you can use this stuffing for anything, not only the melaton. You can put this inside of a fish stuffing. You can stuff a chicken breast with it. This is a beautiful. We do combine seafood and, oh, yeah. and meat. How's yours over there? Oh, it's looking good. Smelling oh, good. Too. Okay, well, look, let me do this. I'm going to go ahead and throw the breadcrumbs. I would cook this about another 10 or 15 minutes. And remember, i got to go into the oven to bake it, so I don't want to overcook it. I'm going to put enough seasoned Italian breadcrumbs in to pick up the butter and all of that to thicken that uh, stuffing. Yeah, let's get a good handful of that. Uh, you, see, you see, this is what it looks like when it all cooks down. And uh, now you want to go ahead and stuff one of those? Sure. I'll tell you what, stuff two of those because I'm going to put them in a little skillet. Now what do I do with them once they're stuffed? I'll put a little butter on top of them, naturally. They're going to go into that 350 degree oven. They're going to be toasted nice and brown. Normally two of them are served on a plate at a time. And they are an entree. Or you can kind of tone it down a little bit and just have a nice casserole. You don't have to put it in the shell. You can actually put it in a casserole dish and bake it as well. So how is that coming? Huh? Oh, it's good. Oh, this smells so good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, go ahead and uh, get that up. Bring that little black skillet after you put that one in it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I want to be generous. You, know, well, you <laughs> see how you're overstuffing it? That's exactly what we want to do. Just pile it on. Especially if you want to make an entree out of it. Now, I would go on top of it with a pa another pack of butter. <laughs> this is a vegetable, y'all. Okay. Now, this is going to go into a 350 degree oven. It's just going to be absolutely gorgeous. And you can find, uh, you can read a lot about the white melito online right now. Tell them about that project. So right now we're doing a project because as we were talking about, Mr. Israel Tibido was a gentleman who grew. He died in 2013 and many of his uh, melito was uh, disseminated throughout South Louisiana. Chef got a few, I got a few. Um, they did pretty well, but what ended up happening is uh, over the years, a couple of natural disasters between uh, rains and freezes has caused it down to cause it to really be very rare now. And so at this point, at this point, um, we ended up having a, uh, 
only one vine left. Mm -hmm. And so that was your vine. That was mine, one vine. So anyway, with your one vine, we realized that we searched around, there was none other. And we actually did find, we did have one gentleman that had a second one. And so what we've done is between yourself and Melancholy.org out of New Orleans, uh, Dr. Lance Hill, we founded that about 10, 15 years ago. We ended up combining efforts, found a couple of dedicated growers, and do that thanks to your generosity and to uh, Paul Dana out of Metairie with the two vines. And the good fortune of having a spring crop this year. Yeah, we've had, we've had a great crop. Right. We were able to get these coordination between uh, basically five to six growers. And so what we're doing now is if you go to melancholy.org, you'll see a project, the Israel Thibodeau White Melancholy Preservation Project. And what we're doing is we've uh, getting, got a grow in South Carolina and North Carolina, one mobile, um, yourself here in Baton Rouge, and a gentleman in Tacoma, and a gentleman down in uh, Metairie. And so what we'll do is after we have a hopefully successful growth, plant these, uh, we've got these sprouted, we're gonna plant them in September. Um, Hopefully we'll get a small fall crop, and then next year, if we get another spring crop, we're going to find another group of five. Another group. And, and that's really the, 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 the reason for this little cooking demo is to let everyone know that it is our duty to preserve this part of history that was brought here, as we say, by the Aztec Incas and uh, all of these early empires. This was one of their choice vegetables. So, Meliton, M-E-R-L-I-T-O-N, the Meliton Preservation Project that this guy founded, headed up on this property, to be a part of it. And uh, we just want to continue to keep these vines growing. I was lucky enough, I think I have the last vine, I'm not sure, but just by luck, we had it here at White Oak Estate, and now we're able to show you a dish, and uh, just you say, as you say, grow online, and we just want to keep this project going and keep it alive. So, you know what? Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat now. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Well, I'm happy to be here. I'm gonna get some food. <laughs>